Good morning, everyone. We're just going to wait a couple more seconds to see how um, our attendees join in. We're just waiting for a couple more to join in and we'll get started. But thank you very much for joining us. It's great to have you with us. Uh, hopefully you'll find this interesting this morning. We've got lots to talk about uh, because in short, so much is going on um, uh, in, in commercial disputes, but across across the legal board, across the board generally, across the whole world. So uh, commercial disputes is no exception. There's um, lots to tell you about. Okay, well, I'll get started. Um, most importantly, on behalf of uh, Johnny Compton, on behalf of myself as well, uh, and everyone at DMA Stallard, a very, very warm welcome to our um, webinar. It's great to have you with us. Um, obviously, this is a convenient form of sharing information, um, and hopefully it will become um, even more prevalent than, than it is now. Uh, we're certainly finding it very helpful, and as you'll learn, this kind of platform is not only being used for learning, but uh, reaching commercial disputes business as well, sorting out legal disputes, making historic court decisions, uh, mediation, everything. Um, it's all happening remotely. Um, to a very, very large extent, to a larger extent than we ever possibly imagined um, previously. So here we go. Um, I hope you're all surviving uh, lockdown as much as, as you can be. And not only that, where you can, I hope you're thriving uh, as much as possible. And like us, looking forward to things returning to normal. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 has created terribly tough times uh, for all of us, um, and it's changed life uh, for many people in so many, so many ways. And it's fair to say that, that, that in terms of resolving commercial disputes, that is no different. Um, things have changed radically in, in some ways, um, not at all in others, um, but in, importantly, we're seeing uh, new laws that are, that are coming in at a, a pace that, and frequency that we, we, we don't commonly see. Um, and we're seeing, we're seeing methods changing overnight um, so we want to give you a roundup of, of, of what's happening, um, how it's affected us, how it might affect you, um, so that everyone's better informed and better able to deal uh, with, with these disputes. As you can imagine um, in, a, in a normal circumstance, the law is tricky enough because we get a new law, it gets itself bedded in, uh, we, get on, we get a chance to read and understand what it, what, what it means. Um, and then our, you know, in the process of, of two, three years, we get to see some court decisions and test the new law, to find out what it really want, means and what judges want it to mean. Um, we don't have that luxury at the moment. We've got new law arriving every couple of minutes and we, we're hoping we understand what it means as, as we apply it. Um, and, and we're doing the best we can. Judges are doing the best they can, but you can imagine it's, um, an, ex it's an extraordinary time um, in the context of uh, commercial disputes alone. So uh, to give you a quick overview in terms of what we're going to do, um, part one of this webinar is going to be my colleague, Johnny Compton, and he's going to present to you on those three subjects that you can see on the slide. So how has COVID-19 affected the court system? Uh, he'll then um, look at some technical detail on new insolvency provisions, director's duties, and the forthcoming UK chapter 11 protection. Uh, he'll then have a look at the, the kind of broad topic of how we deal with those people who are refusing to pay. Uh, extraordinary time, we, we, we're not able to serve uh, winding up petitions and statutory demands in some respect, um, or in some cases. Um, so uh, extraordinary that we don't have those tools in our armoury. So Johnny's going to have a closer look at that and, and the impact, and the alternatives that we have available. Part two is then me looking at um, the kind of disputes that you can expect to be prevalent over the coming months. And then I'll finish with a case study that will bring out a kind of wider discussion about how we're coping with this new world where court hearings are being dealt with remotely. Um, and we have, I have an example of a case that I've dealt with uh, very recently. In fact, the most recent hearing was, was yesterday. Uh, so I'll be able to give you an idea of how it really works uh, in this new world. After that, we'll move on to a Q&A um, where we will take your questions. Now, the way we're going to make that work is for uh, you guys, as, as soon as you, you have a question, please use the Q&A function. So if you have 
hover on your Zoom screen, you'll see at the bottom, next to participants, there's a Q&A button. Uh, just click on that, put your questions in there, and Johnny and I will look at those questions as we go through, and then we'll answer them uh, in turn towards the end of the webinar. So feel free to ask away. Uh, if we can't answer all of your questions, uh, we will do our best to um, provide you with an answer uh, after the event. Uh, lastly then, the standard kind of housekeeping um, information, there's, there's a chat function next to the Q&A button. So if you have any kind of technical issues or you've got any admin requests or post uh, webinar requests, please, please use that chat function during the webinar. Obviously anything that arises after the webinar, you can just drop us an email. Um, so there you go. <coughs> We're good to go, but just before we do press ahead with the main content, I thought it might be an idea just to get you guys to let us know what experience you have uh, of any changes in the way that the court system has been operating. So a couple of two small questions um, by a poll. If you could answer these, that would be helpful. But the, the first question is, have you had a hearing which was due to take place for you, for your clients, for um, your organisation? Um, the due to take place uh, since Easter 2020. Have you had that hearing either cancelled, adjourned, or converted to a case management hearing? So have you had the, the can kicked down the road on, um, on a hearing? I'll just wait for you to answer that question. Got some few more, we've got a few more answers coming in, so we're waiting there. So there we go, there's a, there's a sizable number of people that have actually experienced this. Um, perhaps those who haven't, haven't had any hearings uh, in the calendar in that period. But good to know that we're speaking to people who, who um, are living the system as much as we are. So on to the next question. Have any of you out there attended a virtual hearing? Um, and that can be even prior to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and lockdown restrictions. Thanks for answering. I see the answers are coming in. So we'll just wait for a few more. Yep. Thank you very much. So some of you have in fact uh, attended a virtual hearing. Good to hear. Majority of you haven't, vast majority of you haven't. Um, so that, that's good. We can, we can tell you a bit more about it as, as the um, webinar progresses. So let's get cracking. Um, I'll hand over to you, Johnny. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Rob. The uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has affected the courts and the legal system really like no other crisis for, uh, in living memory. There's no doubt about that. It, it has resulted in the total shutdown of the court system for face-to-face -face, uh, hearings. So uh, what, how did the courts react? Well, almost immediately, the Lord Chancellor, uh, the Master of the Rolls, the, chief, the heads of the uh, divisions of the senior court, the high court, uh, if you will, and the Lord Chief Justice formed a committee and very quickly put into effect a system for having, first of all, telephone hearings and then uh, virtual uh, hearings uh, as as much as, as as we are as we are doing uh, now. Uh, and the uh, 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 almost immediately, Lord Newburgh, uh, a former president of the UK Supreme Court. Um, decided and wrote an article indeed saying that large corporate uh, companies need some protection from uh, their creditors during the period when they are not trading uh, through no fault of their own uh, and uh, what can the courts do to effectively give them a, a debt holiday um, and that's item two on our agenda and of course um, that leaves uh, on the other side of the coin if you like uh, the creditors themselves uh, with uh, how to advise themselves, uh, how to equip themselves to deal with those uh, of their uh, debtors uh, who, who refuse uh, to pay. So if you can move on to the next slide. 
So roughly 45% of the court system has been uh, completely closed. In other words, they're not conducting virtual hearings, they're not conducting uh, any type of hearings uh, at all. And so what we've had is a very rapid uh, expansion of, of remote hearings and few, uh, if any, indeed, hearings are now conducted uh, face to face. So um, how, how have the uh, uh, courts adapted? Well, unsurprisingly, the higher courts have adapted best. So what do we mean there? We mean the senior court, the high court, uh, as was, uh, and its various divisions, family, commercial, uh, Queen's Bench, Chancery, um, because they have the resources and they have fewer cases. And the cases that come before them tend to have silks or very senior junior barristers. Uh, and so they're well capable uh, of dealing with remote hearings. Um, the number of adjournments has gone up, but still, if you look at the, uh, the average delay on cases, um, the courts are doing remarkably well, in fact. And if you look at the statistics, the uh, average increase in the time of cases has been two to three weeks. So still within the system, within the European legal system, we are, uh, not to blow one's own trumpet, but we are the, the best performer uh, in terms of uh, our court speed uh, and quality of service. Now, conversely, unsurprisingly, the county courts and more junior courts um, have not fared so well. Now, that's not surprising. Um, in front of a, a deputy district judge or a district judge, you're going to have on an applications day, sometimes 10, sometimes 20. On a bankruptcy day, you're going to have as many as 25, 30 hearings uh, in a day. Now, when you've got a waiting room full of people waiting to get on, the usher, um, who's usually who's hugely experienced, will come out, uh, take the names of those cases who are ready, and slot them in to the system uh, on, a, 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 on a way that is uh, flexible um, uh, and first come, first serve. Now, of course, if you've got a telephone hearing slot and you miss it and you're not ready, well, that's the end of that. You've lost it, it's gone. Um, the court will then try and pick up the pieces uh, and try and deal with the costs thrown away as best it can. You're also in the county courts dealing with um, unrepresented uh, parties. And so uh, if we look at the fourth box there, what we had initially, as from the 23rd of March when the lockdown was announced, was uh, a plethora of practices with uh, courts sending out directions as best they could. That right they, right, they said to themselves, we've got to handle this. Um, we've got to deal with, with the cases. Let's just work the problem and get practical solutions. First of all, telephone hearings, and then we had Zoom, and then we had Skype, Skype for Business, et cetera, et cetera. And so gradually, um, eventually, practice directions from on high, Lord Chief Justice, uh, Master of the Rolls, Head of the Civil Division of the Court of Appeal, handed down uh, their practice directions, and so we're all a lot happier. Um, the initial, uh, it was a Zoom, <laughs> frankly, uh, I had a hearing on the uh, 6th of April, um, and it was litigants in person, totally unrepresented, and she had her two kids, um, uh, day three or day four of lockdown, it's the 6th of April, it's the Monday, um, and they were playing Call of Duty Black Ops in the background there, hitting each other and beating each other with pillows and what have you, and just as, as the judge was trying to plow on, the, the council was going on magisterially with his skeleton argument on cost, and all hell was breaking loose. A couple of days later, April 10, um, the judge's Labrador uh, came in, and first of all, he saw his black tail waving, and then it leapt up onto the table, its front two paws, looked into the screen. It was like the hand of the basketball. So anyway, the, we now have practice directions. It's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot easier uh, now. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, and I'll move on in my computer here. Right, we are reopening the courts, okay, and the Civil Justice Commission, um, it, it's a lot easier in the civil courts, of course, because we don't have juries. Um, and so uh, we can reopen courts fairly easily. Hastings is reopening. Um, Slough and Staines, and that won't surprise you, they are very busy courts in major population centres uh, and they are reopening. So the, uh, the headline is that after an initial turbulent start, 
the legal profession, the judicial profession, and the, the administrative civil service side of the, of the court staff have really got their acts together and are working together now. Uh, and Rob is going to do a, a, a case study later and see what actually happened as to how the courts really can work uh, the problem uh, and, and get behind the case and, and push it forward. So if we move on to the next slide, Right, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Now stay with me because this is a really exciting uh, piece of legislation and I'm afraid whether you like it or not, okay, it is going to massively affect you, all right, because the principal weapon that we have if we're representing creditors against a company uh, where the debt uh, is over, this, over the prescribed limit, £750 still, um, we have uh, the winding up petition. Now, the new bill comes into force and says, right, as from the 27th of April through to the 30th of June, um, and then for a further month after the act comes into force, and we'll come into that in, a, in, a, in just a little while, there will, the courts simply will not entertain corporate insolvency applications, petitions. So that is, if you like, the nuclear option, which has been knocked out of our hands if we are suing companies. Now, from a, a constitutional point of view, uh, and, and bear with me, uh, it, it's very exciting from, from a lawyer's point of view, the, um, the act is retrospective. If you notice, it actually goes back to the 27th of April. Very few pieces of legislation in this country, indeed if any, are retrospective. Um, so it is uh, certainly uh, uh, new times constitutionally as well as economically and legally. Um, and we can see that uh, in action, if you like, that retrospective effect. If we look at re a company injunction to restrain presentation of a winding up petition, and that was heard uh, on the 2nd of June. So the act hasn't even come into force yet. Um, the, uh, the judge, uh, Mr. Justice Morgan, said, yeah, I, I am going to throw this bankrupt, this, this insolvency out, effectively, um, because um, I am satisfied in my own mind this act is going to come into force and it will be retrospective and it will provide a defense to the company. Um, so uh, the, um, the, the debtor was left with an order for costs to add insult to injury. Uh, it's several tens of thousands of pounds and off, off they had to go and try and look as happy as they can about it. Now, moratoriums and monitors and chapter 11. Why have I used the chapter 11? I've used it as a convenient shorthand. We hear, um, on the news all the time, companies in the US filing for protection under Chapter 11. But that is effectively what this piece of legislation does. And it's entirely new. It's a separate, freestanding um, protection, which the courts will have after this act comes into force, which I suspect will be sometime this week or early next week. Um, and if you are a company, um, a director, and you think that the company is in danger of going under, um, you can make an application to the court. Now, you need a monitor, and this monitor uh, needs to be a qualified insolvency practitioner, and this monitor needs to certify that this company is a going concern, or will be, after the period of protection. Now, the period of protection can be an initial period of 20 days, extendable by 20 days, so you're up to 40 business days, if I didn't make that clear, business days, uh, without the uh, uh, consent of the creditors, or up to one year with the consent uh, of, of the creditors. So um, during that time period, uh, no petitions can be brought and the business is protected from its creditors. Normally whilst it gets into, uh, into the realms of refinancing and restructuring, that may involve redundancies over a period of time, may involve all sorts of things. Um, but uh, it, it really does allow um, companies uh, a degree of protection. So it's worth looking at if you are a company director and you do feel you need a breathing space. It's the holiday that Lord Newberger was talking about. Now, on the flip side of that, um, the uh, uh, moratorium period also disapplies what we call ipso facto clauses. Now, hold on, hold on, but don't, don't, don't fall asleep, don't, just relax. An ipso facto clause basically is um, me as a supplier to a business that's going under, being able to say, oh, I have a clause in my contract that says, if you are uh, in debt to me for my goods and services, I am not bound to provide those services anymore. Now, under this act, when it comes into force, I can't rely on that. In other words, notwithstanding, despite the fact that they owe me money, 
I am still bound to continue to supply them services. Now that's quite terrifying, if you, if you think about it. Um, and what the, um, uh, in order to balance that slightly, the government said, right, we, we, can't, we can't put small businesses at risk. So if you are a business with under, uh, 12, uh, under 10.2 million turnover, under a 5.1 asset balance sheets, or balance sheet assets, but you're probably get that right, um, and under 50 employees, or two out of those three, then you, you can stop supplying services and goods to a company that you know is going under, okay? Um, but otherwise, no, you have to keep supplying services and goods even though you know it's going under if there's an application for more at all. So from that respect, it, it's, quite, it's, quite, uh, it's quite scary. Now, after you had a cup of coffee and a sit down, um, the uh, director's duties, uh, liability under COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 age. Um, I think it, it struck government um, and Rishi Sunak in particular uh, that um, the Insolvency Act, section 214, provides for um, a liquidator to make an application to the court that a director is personally liable and should pay assets into the company to be distributed to creditors in the event of an insolvency if, it, it, the, if in the liquidator's opinion the director knew or ought to have known that the company was going under and could not avoid an insolvent liquidation. What the new section 10 of this new act does is to allow the court to assume that during the relevant period, and the relevant period for our purposes is the, the 1st of March to the, to the 30th of, of June, or one month after the act comes into force, to, um, uh, to say that during that period, uh, any insolvency uh, is not bound to the, any wrongdoing on the part of the director. So it provides a huge amount of protection to small businesses and big businesses alike. Um, if during that period there is a worsening in the company's financial position, um, it provides a protection against the director being made personally liable if indeed the company does go under. So it, it really is uh, a, a um, uh, this this act uh, is a um, a real game changer in, in respect of, uh, of of corporate corporate debt and corporate companies. Right, let's have the next slide. So there we can see that's the actual wording of section 10 of the, uh, of, of the new act. And what it says is, right, in determining for the purposes of section 214, and that is, if you like, the director having to make a contribution to the uh, assets of the company, okay, uh, the court is to assume that the person, in other words, the director, is not responsible for any worsening of the financial position of the company or its creditors that occurs during the relevant period. And the relevant period um, will be uh, one month after the act comes into force and runs uh, indeed from the 1st of March. So it, it really is uh, for a small company, big company directors, um, a real protection in my view during the, the current emergency. Right, the next slide. And we can see that's the progress of the bill. Um, and indeed it is at report stage today, 23rd of June, 2020. It's gone through all its stages, green stages there in the Commons, and it's gone through all its red stages in the Lords. Obviously, the House of Commons is in green, the House of Lords is in red. Um, and um, we are expecting royal assent either, I suspect, uh, this afternoon or indeed on Friday. Um, so it will come into law. And that's, uh, that's uh, one of the most, as I say, far-reaching uh, reforms to corporate law there has been in a very, very long time. Right. Uh, next slide. Um, so we've seen, um, and this is the nuts and bolts, if you like. So you've got your judgment, you've been to court, um, and the judge has found in your favour what uh, uh, remedies do you have? Now we've seen that winding up is not available at the moment to us. Now we've got a writ of control, uh, and you have to say this very carefully, fieri facias is, is the, the writ there, and that is the High Court uh, Enforcement Officers, bailiffs, sheriffs. Uh, attending uh, and carting off goods. Now that's fine if your judgment is 15,000 pounds odd. Uh, it's not so great if your judgment is 150 million 
So it is, it, it's a limited remedy, I'm afraid. Now the third party debt order there, you can take control of the company bank account, um, but you need to know, uh, you need to be able to supply the judge with those details uh, in order that the judge can make that order. Uh, and you have an order to obtain information, you can put a, uh, the court can order the company officer, company secretary or company director, to attend to give evidence on oath as to the company's assets and liabilities. And that will give you the information you need uh, as to the company bank account. And bear in mind that interest on judgment debts is at 8%. Now, given that the Bank of England base rate at the moment, I think, is 25 basis points, point, uh, 0.25%, that is not too shabby. Right. Um, I think that's that for that slide. Let's move on to the next slide. And I'm going to hand over to Rob. Thanks, Johnny. Appreciate that. Um, so you can see that there's lots going on. Um, uh, we're, we're obviously keeping pace with things, but uh, you know, it, it's a daily task of um, understanding what's changing and um, how we need to respond to that. So now I want to move on to part two of the webinar, where I'm going to look at. Um, the kind of disputes that you can expect to be prevalent over the coming months. No, no great surprise here. Um, you can see from this slide uh, the, the broad categories that I've included. Um, kicking things off with debt claims, obviously, you know, people are struggling, businesses are struggling. I'm sure you know people or you're experiencing this yourself who have suffered almost a, a complete um, seizure of revenue. So some of our clients are um, getting, you know, negative percentage revenue compared to prior to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is that they're, they're, they're paying out refunds instead of earning any money whatsoever, especially in the holiday sector. Um, so people, uh, business cannot afford to pay its debts, generally speaking. There are lots who are uh, being very responsible and ticking along and paying off their suppliers. Um, but you know as well as I do that there's a, there's a big uh, amount of debt claims uh, growing that are going to have to be dealt with at some point. Um, lots of people appear to us to be storing those up um, in the interest of cooperation and good faith, uh, but, but they're coming. Uh, we've spoken uh, on, about insolvency matters, won't say too much about that, but clearly we've got this moratorium that Johnny has spoken about um, uh, that's that's plugging the, the system and that the minute you take that plug out there's going to be a huge demand for uh, insolvency procedures. Commercial rent arrears. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of clients uh, chasing commercial rent arrears, a lot of clients who are trying to negotiate paying uh, a reduced amount in terms of rent with commercial rent arrears. Uh, I'm sure uh, lots of you will have heard that the, the big news on uh, on rent arrears, that there's a, mor a moratorium on um, actually taking back possession uh, of commercial premises. That was due to last up until the end of the month, but um, change yesterday, that, that period has been extended now uh, until the end of September, so it covers the September quarter day. So again, another key um, a weapon in the armory of, of making sure that, debt, uh, that rent paid on time has been taken away from, from landlords. Um, and the same too, we, you know, we're talking about rent arrears, but you know uh, the position is very similar with regards to residential rent. Possession actions um, have been um, st stopped as well, so that there's a moratorium on possession actions for residential property. That too has been extended very recently. Uh, that's going to be extended until the 23rd of August. So again, another plug in the system, uh, a huge build up behind that plug. Insurance claims. Um, very interesting, very topical. Uh, many of you may have heard about the uh, claims that businesses are making for business interruption um, insurance. So that obviously the basis of the, the interruption is COVID-19. Um, some businesses have already claimed against their insurers for business interruption and had those claims denied. Um, famously, Hiscox has denied uh, business, in business insurance interruption uh, claim. Um, and the Financial Conduct Authority has already been involved. So what they've said is a couple of things. Number one, you, you insurers better stop paying out your dividends because you're gonna have a lot of, claim, uh, lot of claims. And number two, uh, we expect you to make good on your uh, business insurance or business interruption policies. 
um, and pay out on them. And if you don't, um, as a default position, then you need to be writing to us to explain why you're not doing that. So look out for a lot of activity in that space. There's already a class action building against Hiscox in respect of, uh, of that, as I mentioned a minute ago. Obviously, uh, a huge uh, number of consumer issues are arising, especially with regards to travel. Um, I don't need to say too much about that. Uh, employment rates and matters. Well, uh, we, I won't get into the detail, but in general terms, you, you will understand that we're going through this extraordinary period where not only is there a great pressure um, on businesses to make redundancies, but we've got this novel furlough scheme. So it's a brand new scheme everyone's struggling to understand and needing to, needing to get advice on, on it. Um, so they're dealing with a new piece of legislation, a new furlough scheme, terrible pressure on revenue, a terrible pressure to make redundancy. So what we're seeing is that lots of mistakes are being made. Uh, people are making redundancy very quickly um, and not always properly. Um, so for example, I, I um, did see that one fairly large company made a swathe of redundancies via Twitter. Um, so there's going to be some comeback on, on that kind of uh, activity. Uh, you can explain that. Something I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about now is uh, disputes over contractual obligations. You can just imagine uh, the scale and the size, uh, the, the, the number of disputes that are going to flow. It's going to be, there's going to be a wave of this type of dispute um, in the coming months because people are struggling to meet their contractual obligations. And whenever that happens, people will always either just clam up, bury their head in the sand, or if they're a little bit more sensible, then they'll look for an excuse not to pay. Okay, what we have seen um, is that there's some uh, government guidance produced uh, by the, the cabinet office uh, only a couple of days ago, a few days ago, and, and it's, it's basically a, a voluntary code of conduct. It's basically the cabinet office, office saying, guys, let's be sensible about this. People are going to be struggling to make their contractual obligations. Okay? What they want to see is a spirit of cooperation. They want to see uh, sensible behavior to try and uh, achieve a practical outcome. So I, I guess what they're hinting at is, is not pursuing you're the person who has the benefit and, and you're not in bridge. But they're trying to say, look, don't rely on your express um, contractual provisions uh, to the nth degree. Do what you can to reach some kind of agreement uh, with the other uh, contractual party. Um, and uh, as a reminder, that is a, a, only a voluntary um, piece of guidance. It's a code of conduct. It's not binding in any way, um, but uh, you can see the mood. You can see that people are being encouraged to adopt that, that attitude. If we go beyond that then and, and we, we consider that there might be people who do want to rely on their contractual, contractual obligations and push those who are in breach to fulfill uh, their obligations, then we start getting into the realms of force majeure uh, and frustration. So many of you will have heard of um, the concept of force majeure, um, but what does it mean? It's, it's, it's often understood. What we're talking about now is someone um, who has an obligation to perform a, um, uh, some kind of act uh, under a contract, whether it be paying something, supplying something, whatever that might be. Um, and for whatever reason, that person deems that they cannot fulfill that obligation. They can't supply the goods, they can't supply the services. What are they going to do? So they're going to start looking at their contractual terms, if they're sensible. Some people might just shout out force majeure, expecting that to be uh, the miracle remedy. But that's not going to work um, unless, in the first instance, you actually have a force majeure clause in your contract. So that's point one. Force majeure, which means, uh, in essence, superior force, something, some kind of supervening event, a curveball comes in from the side and, and knocks out the status quo to the extent that parties can't perform obligations. That's what it's there. Uh, to, to cater for. But what many people don't realise is that this isn't something that exists in the general body of law. It's something that must be in your contract. If you want to rely on force majeure, you must in this country have a force majeure clause. Okay, so that's the, that's the starting point uh, for trying to get out of your contractual obligations. 
or seeing if another party is able to get out of their obligations um, and seeing if you can press them to perform. Have a look, is there a force majeure clause? Okay, that's step one. If there is, that's not the end of the story because force majeure clauses are generally interpreted on a very, very narrow basis. Okay, and so even if you have a force majeure clause, it may not cover a COVID-19 situation. Okay, so it may, not, it may not include the words pandemic, for example. It may not include the words uh, or that, that fantastic word whatsoever, which would broaden out your, your force majeure clause and encompass a much wider range of supervening events or as to use those words I used earlier, superior forces um, at work. So you will only be able to get out of a contractual obligation if the superior force that is stopping you, in this case, COVID-19 and the restrictions that follow, if that is included within the meaning of your force majeure clause, okay? And once you've got that far, if you're able to show that, yeah, we're definitely covered by this force majeure clause, even if you've got the word pandemic in there, you have to appreciate that that's not the end of it. That doesn't get you off the hook entirely uh, with regards to your obligations. It will only suspend performance as much as is necessary. So if you've got obligations going over the next five years um, and you and once the restrictions on COVID-19 are created by COVID-19, you should then be in a position um, in many cases to carry on performing your obligations. So it's only a suspensory concept. It's not something that will get you off the hook entirely. Okay, so that's force majeure. Remember, it's got to be in the contract and you've got to look very closely at the width of the, of the clause itself. Moving on then to frustration, very different concept. If it, you found that you've had a look at the contract, there's no force majeure provision, what the next sensible step to do is look at frustration. And again, this is, this is what you need to do on both sides of, of the contract. So if you're the person who's paid the money and wants someone to perform their obligations, you need to be looking at these clauses and these, these concepts in law to figure out what the person on the other side is going to try and do and um, whether they, they can do that legitimately. So I'll give you an example. I, I act for a boat manufacturer based in France um, and they spent, uh, their legal team spent an entire two week period reviewing every single contract uh, to, to find out uh, whether people were going to try and get out of their obligations or not. And once you've done that, and you, you realize there's no um, force majeure, think about the concept of frustration. Okay, so in, in, an, in a nutshell, what is frustration? This is uh, an, an, something where you as the performing party, you haven't done anything wrong, you've not breached the contract, but somehow you find yourself unable to fulfill your obligation. Okay, note these bullet points here. So it doesn't have to be included in the contract. That's the great thing about frustration. That's probably the only great thing about frustration um, because the next point tells you it's very, very tough to prove. Judges do not like relying on frustration. Okay, So it's a very, very high bar to get over to, to persuade a judge that what has happened has frustrated your um, ability to perform your contractual obligations. Now, right, what, I, what I mean by that is that essentially what frustration is, is um, the law says if something, some supervening event happens, that means that your, your performance of the contract becomes radically different to what you had actually signed up for, then that contract is capable of being frustrated. Okay, We're not saying COVID-19 has made it much harder for me to uh, perform my obligations under the contract and it's going to make it much more expensive for me or I'm going to make a loss or I'm going to make hardly any profit. It's not saying that because if that's if that's all it is for you to perform your obligations that you're going to get paid less and it's not commercially attractive anymore, frustration will fail. You will not be able to prove that your um, the contract is frustrated on that basis. Okay. It has to be something that's radically different. So I'll give you a, an example. Let's say uh, you as a landlord have agreed to let a uh, commercial premises to a tenant. There's an electrical fire 
um, on a floor below. No, no one's fault. When I say no one's fault, no one, uh, either landlord or tenant, it's not neither of their fault. But the building burns down; it can't be occupied. Okay, so um, you've got you've got a fairly frustrating um, situation, and the landlord is clearly not able to uh, make good on its obligation to provide that premises. So frustration is likely to work. Imagine a contrasting scenario now, which you might not think is that different, but imagine a uh, container ship uh, full of cars that's, that's coming from China to the UK. Okay, it's going to make use of the Suez Canal to reduce its, um, the length of its journey substantially. And um, when, it get, when it gets there on its way towards the Suez Canal, it finds out that the canal, canal is actually shut. So now what it's got to do is think about an alternative route. So where's it going to go? but it's got to go all the way around the southern tip of, of Africa. Okay, so it's got to go around the Cape of Good Hope and all the way back up the Atlantic. So you can just imagine that, that, that whoever is responsible for that freight is not going to be making any money on that particular journey. They'll probably make a substantial loss. Okay, but that situation did arise and it went to court and the, the court ruled that that is not a frustrating event. Okay, so even that, you, you might argue, and, and, and I might argue, that that is a radically different task to um, transport from uh, through the Suez Canal a much longer journey. So if you're doubling or tripling the length of your journey, is that not radically different? Well, according to the court, it's not, because your obligation is to transport this ship full of cars to the UK. That, that has not radically changed. It's going to be much more inconvenient. It's going to be much more expensive for the freight company but frustration will not work. So there you go. I hope that, that gives you um, a sense of, of what frustration means. Not something you can expect to rely on in most cases, but don't rule it out. It's there. And often, uh, even if you were to raise it as an argument, that the person on the other side, if they're following the um, cabinet's office guidance on um, contractual obligations that's just come out, they might agree to adopt a fair and reasonable approach and cooperate with you to find a way that's not so painful for you. We move on to the next slide, please. So there you go. That's that's um, the, the first bit of my part two. The second part is, is a case study. I just want to give you a flavour of what it's what it's actually been like, just in case uh, it affects your decision making um, in terms of whether you're going to pursue a dispute, whether you're going to just abandon a claim. Um, or whether you're, you're, you're thinking about defending something uh, and wondering the extent to which you can, can do so. So here's the case study. Um, I was instructed on a Monday morning uh, by a company and uh, one of its directors was being harassed by a client of theirs, and quite seriously harassed to, to the extent that um, the, the, the director who was being harassed at one point feared for his life, okay? So their instructions to us were, we really need to stop this person and we need to stop them fast because of what's happened just yesterday. We need an injunction against him. The police aren't doing anything. So uh, we took some detailed instructions, made an application to the court by Wednesday evening. Um, and an application, we, we managed to get an application hearing fixed in on Friday morning. Okay. So that's the time scale. Instructed on Monday, application made Wednesday evening after the court closed. They called us on the Thursday saying, yes, that's great. We'll get you on. We can see how urgent it is. We'll get you a telephone hearing on Friday morning. Okay, so rapid time scale. Uh, moving on to the, the bottom half of the slide, the court, how, what was the experience with the court? Well, it, that we had extreme inconsistency between individual court staff. So on the, on the Tuesday, I'm, I'm speaking to various court staff and they're saying, look, we'll get you on. We can see this is, a, this is urgent. Send it all across by email. We don't normally accept hundreds of pages of documents electronically because we have to print them off and we don't want to do that. So normally you'd have to send it all in paper, but obviously we're losing days if we're sending things by post. So that, that, that was the good end. At the other end, once the application was lodged, we, we had another uh, member of court staff immediately fire back an email saying, sorry, not having it, um, send it by post. There's too many pages. Okay, so that's what I mean on that first bullet point: extreme inconsistency between individual court staff. 
I think the overarch uh, overarching point I want to make, though, is that the court staff are horrendously busy right now. Um, there are probably fewer of them because of, of shielding concerns and um, general sickness absences. But as, as a whole, they're under a huge amount of pressure, but coping extremely well. There's a, there's a really strong can-do attitude, especially in the higher courts, the Chancery Division in particular. Um, but you will find people who are under so much pressure that they throw the, throw the kind of rules of good behaviour out the window uh, and give you a very hard time just to make uh, small progress. So in this particular case, um, all of our evidence was accepted electronically, and that was really important because we did have, as well as uh, photographic evidence, we had video evidence as well that we really wanted the judge to see. Uh, thankfully, we captured one of the uh, incidents on four different video cameras uh, from different buildings. Um, and it's, it can be really tricky in usual circumstances to get a judge um, in front of video evidence because the courtroom that he's got might not have the facilities, as simple as that. They might, might only be one or two courts, even up at the, the Rolls Building at the High Court and Chancery Division in London. You, you have to get the right courtroom to, to, for the judge to look at the, the, the CCTV evidence. But in this case, uh, we were able to uh, get, get the CCTV evidence in front of him much more easily than we otherwise would have done. Um, and a large part of that was due to the, the, the judge being extremely helpful, facilitative, um, and just embracing uh, the new technology, the, the remote hearing and, and accepting uh, file transfers, that kind of thing. Um, as I mentioned on the last bullet point there, the court managed to fix us a hearing within 12 hours of the application actually being made. So uh, really speedy work for a court that's under pressure. Can we have the next slide, please? Here we go. The hearing itself was conducted by telephone. It wasn't a remote hearing. Um, it, it was sorry, it wasn't a video hearing on on any of, any of the platforms that are currently being widely used. Um, the judge had all his evidence electronically. Really importantly, because the, the the court accepted a file transfer, all of all of the evidence, the judge could look at the the all of the evidence via via his file share platform, and he didn't have to download anything. He sat at home with his laptop. He, he could view all the videos using our file share platform uh, without having to download anything. So it's very, very quick. We could email everything to him immediately before the hearing. Normally you have to worry about evidence making its way to the judge. Often it doesn't, it doesn't, it gets lost. Um, but he had everything, anything he didn't have, we could email him straight away um, during the hearing even. So having that facilitative attitude was, was, was a great help helped us that the judge reviewed everything prior to the to the hearing what was that what actually happened in this case it doesn't always happen is that the court staff emailed him the pdfs of the evidence he scanned through it um, and then he reviewed the, the cctv at the very start of the hearing and his mind was made up the outcome uh, we've got our, our injunction order granted but that's not always that's not the end of the story because once you've got your injunction order what you need is a sealed copy of that order so you can actually enforce it straight away and the court staff, again, they work miracles. They got us the order by the end of that same day. Um, again, a mixed experience. We, the first time they sent it to us, half of the page wasn't scanned, so you couldn't read the order. And when I chased it up, the, the, the court staff member that I got hold of was very, very cross with me for chasing. Um, but they came good um, because there are lots of good people in the court service working very, very hard um, with limited resources. So there you go, that, that was the outcome, that's how successful it was. Um, and I, the, the main point of me of highlighting that to you is just to share the experience in case you have a, a situation that needs to be dealt with quickly, um, you know, or you've got something in the pipeline that, that needs to be dealt with. It's going to happen. The court staff have the ability, of course things get adjourned, but where things are really important, we can still deal with them extremely quickly and get the outcomes that we need, you know, in spite of all the restrictions that are in place. So, um, you know, despite the difficulty, despite the pressure on everyone, um, things are working. And I think what we might say is that um, if we could go over to the next slide, we've learned lots of lessons, not just as, as us, but in terms of our clients, in terms of the court service as well. Um, as I mentioned, if you want something done, you can get it done quickly. But, you know, remote hearings will save you money. 
um, as a client, you will save, um, dep depending on what they are, if, it, if it's a, a six week trial, for example, you probably won't save any money because that brings its own difficulties. You tend to have to put more work into making sure everyone's there to making sure that cross-examination cross can happen um, and that it's, that it's effective. So on most hearings, and I mean uh, preliminary hearings, uh, initial hearings, uh, interim hearings, cost hearings, case management hearings, you will save money uh, doing these things remotely. Uh, moving on to the next point, you can see there below, below remote hearings, extreme perseverance is going to be needed, um, especially for urgent, urgent matters. Right. Choice of court is really important because if you if you choose the wrong court, you'll be bounced around, um, or they may not deal with it as quickly as possible. So getting getting advice from us on which court to use is essential. It's a real kind of value judgment that may not be the same from one case to another. And then likely, uh, sorry, the, the the last point is that the courts seem likely to come out of the COVID nineteen restrictions um, much more digitally minded. Um, mixed bag here. Um, I think what I've said there is correct. They, they, they are more digitally minded. And what we're seeing is that at, at the, the high court ends, the courts have really embraced things. And, up, and you know, as, as far up as the chancellor uh, are saying, this, you know, we cannot go back to how it was. We must make some of these changes permanent. Okay. And, that, and, and the kind of changes I mean, I'm talking about remote hearings for, um, initial, for initial matters or interim matters, not the actual trials themselves. I think the, the general consensus is that trials still need to go ahead in person where they can. But then also at the bottom end of the spectrum, uh, with the county court hearings, courts are really, really struggling with, with matters, especially where you've got people who aren't represented by lawyers. You know, um, having, to, having to have Skype hearings for those type of hearings causes terrible trouble with people who aren't familiar with technology. Um, so I'll give you an example of a, something that was mentioned to me yesterday by uh, the court clerk. They had a trial via Skype. It was all going fine. People were dropping off occasionally. As you know, that's what happened with Skype. Um, and th but they got them back on. But halfway through uh, one of the witnesses' cross-examination, the connection dropped out and that was it. That person didn't come back. And the reason for that was simply that that person didn't have Wi-Fi. They were using data, uh, mobile data on their phone, and they ran out of data. Okay. So the trial was over for that reason. So it's horses for courses. You can see that the cap fits um, in many situations, especially for the commercial stuff, where both sides are represented and a full use is being made of technology. Can we have the next slide, please? Right, so we've, we've, um, we've whistled through that. I hope it's not been too speedy, um, but we've, we've tried to cover quite a lot at, at, at a kind of general level. Please let us know if you do have any questions. Um, I can see we've got one question that's popped up in the Q&A there. Johnny, would you like to have a look at that? Got an insolvency related question yeah. here. No, 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 I see that. And, and, and I've, I've got that. It just took me a little while to find the button, actually. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, to find the button to open the Q&A. Um, is there a risk? Yes. The answer to that is yes. Um, now, the, the, there is nothing in the new Section 10 of the uh, Corporate Insolvency uh, Governance Bill uh, to indicate how you challenge as a liquidator an assertion by the um, uh, di director that they acted properly or improperly. Um, and what I think, how I think the courts will look at it is that um, they will look at it as what we call a rebuttable presumption. What does that mean? It means, in effect, um, that uh, if the um, director behaved so badly um, that, uh, in, 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 in all good faith, um, the fault really is theirs and not down to the emergency, then I think the court will read into the legislation um, uh, a, a power, an inherent power, to say, yeah, well, we, 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 we read section 10, uh, but frankly, this, go, this conduct on the part of the director was so awful um, that uh, it, it, uh, it goes beyond that. Interestingly, as, as an adjunct to that, 
um, there is another risk which CBIL, the, the, the new corporate insolvency governance bill does not address, and that is um, applications under the Company Directors Disqualification Act. Now that has been amended, um, new section 15 capital A of that act, um, so that uh, a, uh, if somebody is struck off as a director uh, for uh, conduct which is in breach of the Companies Act 2006, sections 171 to 178 uh, inclusive. And that conduct is so awful, um, not only can they be struck off, but they can be asked to uh, where there are losses to creditors to contribute towards those losses. And that has not been addressed in this, in this bill. I, I'm thinking that that might be a lacuna, it might be uh, addressed later. Uh, but, but there we are, it remains nonetheless, so that there are risks. Um, but um, my view is it, it's the taking the mick rule, okay? Um, and that I think is a good rule of thumb in all uh, corporate law when you're dealing with directors, and that is this. The court is not going to punish you as a director who in good faith has got things wrong, okay? Um, the court will allow for, failure, for honest failure, all right? What it will not do is to contemplate and allow to go unpunished behaviour uh, which is uh, in, in, really morally fault-worthy. That, I think, is, is, is the test uh, here. <clears throat> and that's borne out by the case law. I mean, you can dress it up in all sorts of language, but that's what it really what it boils down to. Thank you very much, Johnny. So we're, we're running out of time. We're, we're almost done. I think... Um, we don't have any more questions. What I would like to just quickly give you um, a summary on is, uh, just, to, just to help you understand what's going on with hearings. Just imagine, um, I want to understand that there are some, some advantages to all these hearings being uh, remotely conducted. So if you go online now and have a look at the daily court list for the High Court, you will see a long list of matters. And um, it really hits home when you look at those, and it tells you the case name and, and um, uh, timings and, and, and uh, a few further details but then on, on the top right you'll have a star and it'll say um, by Skype or Skype for business or Zoom or Spark so every single day there are tens of hearings taking place on these remote platforms okay the the main platform being used is you know I'd say 99% of hearings are taking place by Skype uh, especially Skype for business um, and because most of these hearings are, are public hearings, if you wanted to um, attend any of these hearings, you can, you can go and have a look at that list now, email uh, the email address that's on that list and say, I'd like to attend this. Could I have a Skype link, please? They'll email you straight back and say, here you go. Come along tomorrow, probably best to give a day's notice. And you can sit in some of these hearings and experience what it's like um, uh, to, to deal with a remote hearing. That's, that's good advice if you're um, about to attend a remote hearing yourself, um, or if you're, if you're uh, wanting to understand um, something about a case that's, that's, that's quite relevant uh, to you. Um, it, it's, it's quite an indulgence to take time out of your day and go and sit in the High Court building for something that you're not directly working on. But, you know, um, there's some big piece of litigation going on and you might choose to go to, to uh, listen to some of that for a couple of hours to give you an idea of what's going on. So if it's, if it's, if it's even more closely connected to you and, the, and, the, and a case that you're directly involved with, you know, maybe two or three directors will, can, can sit in and, and listen to say a case management conference and better understand the, the case that you're involved with as a company. Whereas previously there's no way in the world that that many of you would want to attend. And if it's only gonna be half an hour, you can be working away and join onto that call um, as soon as um, as soon as it starts, and you can get notice of that. From so there you go. We'll leave it there. I hope that's been very helpful. Um, really grateful to all of you for joining us. Uh, I can see um, lots of familiar faces. Hello to all of you. Um, look forward to catching up with you in person very soon. Um, thank you very much to to you, Johnny. Uh, thank you very much to um, our uh, events and and marketing business development team to Anne Hardy, uh, to Amber as well for putting this on. Um, it's, it's no mean feat, it's lots of hard work, so we really appreciate your help. Uh, thank you all of you, look forward to catching up soon.